let's pray as we get into the word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this amazing book. Lord, this so full of life. And we pray this morning that you would speak to us through the writings that we read, Lord, that it would be as though we're listening to the voice of Jesus this morning. We thank you so much for our pastor, Lord, and and the group that's been doing ministry out in Japan, and as has already been prayed, we, we echo again, Lord, that you would please keep them safe on the way home. This morning, Lord, we just ask that you would um, just remove any distractions, God, that we could clearly hear what you're saying to each of us. Father, we need you right now more than anything, and so we pray that you meet us here. In Jesus' name. Every now and then... I think it's really important that we ask ourselves, how are we really doing spiritually? Like, really, how are you doing? And it's a really hard question to answer, honestly. How are you really doing? And I think that with the same cadence, we probably should be asking ourselves, how is our church doing spiritually, really? Like, how are we doing as a ministry? And as hard as that question can be to answer, the good news is I think Jesus is the one with his finger on the pulse of his church, and he can show us the reality of our situation. How are we really doing with him today? If you haven't already, turn to Revelation chapter 3. We're currently studying through the New Testament, rounding third base on on the New Testament here. And we've been studying the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia. Today we'll look at the fifth church in Sardis. And we saw several weeks ago in chapter 1, Jesus standing before John. We saw that he was standing as one of his feet like brass. We talked about brass being the metal of judgment in the, in the Bible and how Jesus standing in that place of judgment, the judgment starts at the house of God. And so how appropriate that the book would start with his message to the church first. The world has theirs coming in subsequent chapters, but he's going to deal with the church first. And so today, we've got sh- uh, six short verses. So we're going to look at this letter that is written to the church in Sardis together. And I believe I uh, have a chance to respond to what the Lord would say to us through it. So pick up with me in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these six verses, we want to look at five things. And I've been told you get extra credit if they all start with the same letter. So, we're going to look at the condition of Sardis. We're going to look at the cause of that condition. Then we'll look at a cure for their condition. Jesus then has a caution for those in the church. And then we will finish up looking at Jesus' commitment to the believers in Sardis. You guys remember all that? Alliteration is great, isn't it? All right. So we're going to look, first of all, at the condition of the believers in Sardis. It's a grave condition, wouldn't you agree? Jesus says Sardis has a name or reputation that they are an alive church. But in fact, Jesus says they are dead. Now, I'm going to say something twice here, because you've got to catch this. It's a really important thing to stay on guard of. There are those whose reputation precede them, and there are those whose reputation deceive them. 
I'll say that one more time. There are those whose reputation precede them, and there are those whose reputation deceive them. Sardis, as a church, was in a state of self-delusion, much like the Laodiceans, uh, Laodiceans we'll see in a, in a few weeks, who thought that they were rich and wealthy and without need, but in reality, they were wretched and miserable and poor, blind, and naked. Though they have a reputation of being alive, Jesus says, in fact, you guys are dead as a doornail. I think if, church, uh, if the church of Sardis was here today, it would probably be a very active church. They would probably have lots of activities going on. There would probably be multiple services to choose from on Sunday morning. They may have a very engaging children's ministry, an awesome worship team, and probably a very charismatic speaker. If you attended the church at Sardis, you might even say, man, this church is so full of life. There's so much going on. But honestly, if the passage before us teaches us anything, it's that you can't always tell a dead church from an alive one very easily. Jesus says that they have a name, that they're alive. Now, what's interesting is there could be two things Jesus is highlighting as a problem with this reputation that they have. First is found in the meaning of the word name. Jesus says you have a name that you are alive. It's the word onama. It's where we get our word denomination. It could be that Sardis had got to a certain place where it would be, uh, it would be similar to a group of believers who think that they're alive and well because they have a Calvary Chapel dove on their door. Great name, right? Great denomination. Or Lutheran, or Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian, fill in the blank with whatever group you put a name on for your place you congregate, to think that the church is doing well because it's maybe like another church that does well with the same name is a grave mistake. It's really what I would call the Corinthian problem. You guys remember Paul said that some of them said that they were of Paul or of Apollos or Cephas, but None of them were saved by Paul or Peter or Cephas. They're saved by Jesus. And falling into the, the trap of riding the coattails of spiritual giants who've gone before us and thinking that we are like them because we take their name is a grave mistake. And I think Jesus is pointing out here, hey, you guys might call yourselves X, but in reality, you're nothing like what you call yourself. A second potential problem that Jesus is highlighting with the church in Sardis regarding this reputation could be going as far as making them guilty of blasphemy. I mean, think about it. Above our denomination, the name on our church, whether it be Calvary Chapel or Baptist or whatever it may be, we carry the name of Jesus Christ, do we not? We call ourselves Christian and if there were ever a name that implied that we were an alive group of people, it would be Christian, wouldn't it? Now, you guys know your Bibles really well here. The third commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, the Lord says, you shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, for he will not hold him guiltless who takes the name of the Lord in vain. Now, as it pertains to the subject of blasphemy, I was always taught that that just meant don't use God's name as a cuss word. And it does mean that. That's a t that's, that is a reality. You should not bring the holy name of God down to the level of a cuss word. But blasphemy is so much more than just the way you speak the name of God. In Hebrew, Exodus 20, verse 7, when it says you should not take the name of the Lord, the word take actually means to carry, like you were going to take it somewhere. And to live with this name of Christian... But to live as though we are dead is the same as having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. It's like being a cloud with no rain. It's false advertising. People see you, they see me, they hear what we stand for, but then our lives don't reflect what we say that we are called. And it's taking the name of the Lord in vain. It's blasphemy. Now that might be a little bit harsh, Maybe I'm reading too much into the condition of Sardis. So 
even if they're not guilty of blasphemy, I think we can confidently assess the condition of this church as a church that is writing yesterday's victories at best. That's where they're at. Sardis is a church of the has-been Christian, once doing radical things for Jesus, but now resting on the efforts of yesterday. Perhaps they'd be telling stories about the good old days, often having conversations about the Jesus movement of the 60s. And really, they're probably a church that was born out of a great Jesus movement, but not experiencing a Jesus movement of their own. Not today walking with him in that way. Sardis is like that heavyweight fighter who's won so many fights in the past that they now think preparation isn't necessary. Maybe they don't need to pray before making decisions. Maybe the teachers don't really have to study. I've been on both sides of the preceding or deceiving part of my reputation. When I was a newer believer and I didn't know half of what I know now, in fact, I was probably a lot more um, useful <laughs> to the Lord. And I did uh, do a lot of evangelism as an early Christian. And I remember the first person I led to the Lord my, my, uh, my cousin, Justin. And Justin came for Christmas one year, and I had been sharing the gospel with all sorts of people, and no one was receiving Jesus. And finally, here's this guy. He's got, you know, I've got his attention, and I share the Lord with him. He receives Jesus, him and his girlfriend. Um, and then Justin goes back to where he's from, a small town in Virginia called Waynesboro, and he starts talking about the gospel. And then next Christmas... A second cousin comes with Justin, and before I have a chance to share with her, her name's Brittany, she said, I was hoping you'd preach to me. <laughs> Will you tell me about Jesus? And what a great place to be in. I felt like, oh, thank you, Lord, that, man, I'm doing something right. Half the work's done. Let's share, share the gospel with her. It was great. However, I've been on the other side of that, too, where my reputation has deceived me, where I've shown up for children's ministry, and honestly probably didn't put in as much preparation for the children as I do for Sunday or Wednesday, um, and had a child ask me a question that I didn't have an answer for. <laughs> Not a good feeling. <laughs> um, but I think that this, uh, this condition that Sardis is in is a condition we can find ourselves in. We're overconfident, is what I'm trying to communicate. Being overconfident in what God's done with us in the past, thinking that we no longer need to rely upon him. Sardis, perhaps, has begun to believe its own press. When a Christian starts to do that, uh, they're on a slippery slope. So, we've seen the condition. The condition of Sardis is they have a reputation for being alive. But in actuality, they are a dead church. So, how did they get there? Let's look at our second thing this morning. Let's look at the cause of this condition. I think Jesus perhaps provides a clue in verse 1. Look there again. He introduces himself as he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, is it possible that the Christians in Sardis have stopped relying on the Holy Spirit? Perhaps, like the believers in Galatia, they had begun in the Spirit, but were now attempting to be made perfect in the flesh. And if that is the case, Jesus goes on to say here that he's not found their works to be perfect before God. And so it's not working, just like it wasn't working for the Galatians. Now, if you were here for chapter 1 of Revelation, you know this phrase, seven spirits of God, does not actually mean that God has seven different spirits. We've mentioned that of the 404 verses in Revelation, a full 278 contain allusions or direct quotes from the Old Testament. And we saw that there's really only one place in the Old Testament we know of that references seven with the Holy Spirit, and that's Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. I'd like you to turn there with me uh, as we consider some of the things we discussed in chapter 1 a little deeper this, uh, this morning. Isaiah chapter 11. I'll give you guys a second to turn there. It's important when you're reading Revelation, you understand that the interpretation of anything in the passage, if it is not in the immediate context, it will be elsewhere in the Bible. And so this phrase, he who holds the seven spirits. In Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, 
and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So first here, he's going to go through seven attributes of the Spirit. And first, he says it's the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord. To reject the work of the Holy Spirit is to, in fact, reject God himself. The Holy Spirit is not a concept. He is not, as some of our brothers and sisters believe, inactive in the church today. Uh, we call those people cessationists. They don't think the gifts of the Spirit are available. And to have that kind of view that the Holy Spirit's gone or dead or a concept and not a live person is to reject the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. But he says there again in Isaiah 11, not only the Spirit of the Lord resting upon him, but the Spirit of wisdom. Wisdom has been said to be the proper application of knowledge. It's the how and the why to do what we do. It's getting that word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit. I think of Solomon. Early on, Solomon is assuming the throne, and he says, I don't know how to even go out and come in. I, I don't even know how, if I'm supposed to curtsy when I go to the throne. I didn't watch Dad when he does that. What do I do? And so Solomon asks for what? Wisdom. There is a dependence on God, and that honors the Lord. And when we stop relying on the Holy Spirit, we are really cutting ourselves off from wisdom. But he goes on. He says the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Understanding, the ability to know the will of the Lord and to see beyond surfacey facts to make spirit-inspired decisions based on things beyond our wisdom. Husbands, you know that we're supposed to dwell with our wives with understanding. If you cut yourselves off from the Holy Spirit, you got no chance of understanding. Counsel, it goes on to say there in verse 2, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel. The spirit is the one we go to for counsel. Jesus told us that he would teach us all things and guide us into all truth. Not only do we go to the Holy Spirit for counsel personally, but I would shudder to think about giving counsel to other Christians, other people without the Holy Spirit, to be able to counsel them in their situation. He says the spirit of counsel and might. Number five there. That dunamis power to perform ministry, to face the trials of life, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to preach effectively, to have might is, is not it's just without the Holy Spirit. How do you have any power? How do you do any of this? You just pretend, muster it in your own strength. It's not going to happen. The last two there, it says the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Knowledge, he gives us facts, things we don't know. I remember the first time I saw someone given a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. I was in Bible college, just like 13 years ago, 12 years ago. And um, we were actually uh, in, a, in a service at, at school, the Sunday night chapel, and this teacher, Sean Hausman, is teaching about the gifts of the Spirit, and he's teaching about uh, words of knowledge. And as he's teaching, he says, I'm, I feel like the Lord's giving me a word of knowledge right now um, re regarding a couple that were, were attending school and things they were doing they ought not to be doing. I won't retell the whole story, but he spoke directly to that couple that he didn't even know and told them things, <laughs> not from the pulpit, um, that uh, no one would know unless the Lord had revealed that. Um, and I've seen the Lord do that in, in other times. Maybe you've had people give you a word of knowledge um, about something going on. That doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit. And then he says fear. The beginning of wisdom and knowledge. To fear God so that we do not fear man. Now, to cut yourself off from a total reliance upon the Holy Spirit is to forsake a lot, wouldn't you say? All of that. All those great seven attributes in Isaiah 11 too, and a lot more that we would rightly be called dead without. So question for yourself this morning. 
When was the last time that your life or our church was marked by the supernatural? When was the last time the Lord spoke to your heart to write this in that card and send it to that person? Or you had a word from the Lord or someone for you, or you saw him work miraculously through prayer. I think if it can be explained by our own efforts, then there's a good chance we might be in a place of the sardine church not doing so good. So, the condition. They have a reputation that they're alive, but they are... That, uh, that was a little bit dead, all right. We have a reputation that they're alive, but they are dead. Now, the cause would say they cut themselves from the Holy Spirit. But the good news is a cure. So look here at verse 2, back in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus tells them, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. There's a word you should circle here. It's the word how. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Jesus did not say, remember what you have received and heard. The problem in Sardis is not doctrinal. There's no problem with their statement of faith. There's no uh, similar thing going on like there was in Pergamos where they had the doctrine of Balaam or the Nicolaitans or in Thyatira where they are riddled with the teachings of Jezebel. Sardis has not deviated from sound doctrine. Sardis has forgotten the source of their truth. They've, re- they've drifted from that personal work of the Holy Spirit in their lives and have forgotten how to receive. I think when we start out as believers, there's this childlike dependence on the Holy Spirit. If you've been a believer for a long time and you think back to when you first got saved, you had no option but to believe because you didn't know any better. <laughs> Lord, what about this? <laughs> what about that? And then you grow and you learn things and you have little tricks that you can do and things that you start to rely on other than just a dependence upon the Holy Spirit and forget that the way to receive power is simply to believe in faith and ask for it. I think that the solution to deadness in a church or in a believer's life is to remember how you came to life in the first place. Paul tells the Colossians, he says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith, right? And that's the same way you keep walking with the Lord. By faith. That doesn't change once you've walked with him for a while. It stays the same. I had mentioned the Galatians earlier. If you would, turn a few pages to the left over to Galatians chapter 3 as we look at this question of how to receive. Galatians chapter 3, I'll pick it up in verse 2. Paul tells the Galatians, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? It's a rhetorical question, of course. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies, ongoing, present tense, the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness? If you would... Take a a moment and reflect on when you were closest to Jesus. What did that time look like? What were you doing? What was the state of your heart? What Bible teachers were you listening to? 
How are you getting alone with him? What were you believing for? In the same way that you were in that season of life, the Lord would call you back to that continually. Stay in that place of believing in him. Now, back in Revelation chapter 3, in my Bible, New King James, verse 3, remember therefore how you have received and heard, then there's a semicolon. Anybody else have that semicolon there? I think that semicolon is inspired. It's as though there's a point of reflection and pause. Remember how you have received and heard, pause, hold fast and repent. Hold fast to that first season with the Lord. Don't deviate from that. If we do start deviating from our times of simple prayer and devotion to the Lord, I think we'll experience what Moses experienced. Some of you know this story. Turn over with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I actually think this is a kind of a comical thing. I like this story quite a bit. Um, the 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Recall when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was glowing. He had just spent this time in the presence of God, and he had this glow about him. And it was so bright, and when you read the Old Testament account of this, it sounds as though Moses has to put a veil on his face so that he doesn't blind everybody because he's just shining so much from this time with the Lord. He's just, sorry guys, I'm going to shield, shield this to protect your eyes. But the truth about why he put a veil over his face is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Pick it up with me in verse 5. It says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter kills but the spirit gives life but if the ministry of death the law written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of israel could not look steadily at the face of moses because of the glory of his countenance which glory was passing away how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Now check this out in verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Now, here's what's really going on with Moses. Moses hadn't spent time with the Lord in a few days, and that glory started to fade. And when we, we read Moses' version, I don't know if he, was <laughs> if he was putting it this way, it seems like, oh man, he's just shielding their, their eyes, protecting them, but the truth of the matter is, the glory was passing because he hadn't been in the presence of God anymore and didn't want people to see that it was fading. He wore a veil to cover up that he wasn't shining like he previously was. That veil is the sardine church. That's Sardis. We have this reputation, but really haven't spent time with the Lord ourselves potentially in a long time. That glory fades. But we keep that glory, that greater glory, according to 2 Corinthians 3, that glory that surpasses the law when we spend time being transformed from glory to glory as we spend time with the Lord and his word. All right, so condition of the church. There are, the reputation's alive, but they are... Thank you, guys. We see that they had a cause of that, and that cause they had forsaken the Holy Spirit. And we see that there's... A cure, it's for them to remember how they had received and how they had heard. We're going to come to our fourth thing this morning, quickly. And that is a caution Jesus has for this church. Pick it up in the middle of verse 3 there. He says, Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. This is the second time that Jesus tells them to be watchful. 
And he says if they don't, that he's going to come upon them as a thief, and they won't know when he is coming upon them. This should resonate really well with the believers in Sardis. Sardis is actually the oldest city in Asia, in, uh, Asia Minor. Sardis was built on this kind of plateau hill type of geography where there was sheer cliffs on three sides of the city. And then there's one very steep passage up that they could guard. Didn't have to guard the back sides of the, the cliff because no army is going to climb that cliff. And it had kept them safe for millennia. Now, fact check me on this because I'm not the best with dates and history. Uh, but the way that I've been told uh, about Sardis is that about 1500 BC, the Persians were attacking Sardis and obviously not having success, can't figure out how to scale this cliff. And so the general says to his army, if any man can figure out how to get in there, I'll hook him up with, I don't know, it's probably like an extra horse or something really good. And so they start watching, and the backside of Sardis, this cliff part, they kept one guard. They weren't really watching what was going on there. And that guard dropped his helmet, and it came tumbling down the cliff. And as the soldiers were watching, they saw this guard made his way down, grabbed his helmet, and snuck back up. And they said, wait a second, there's got to be a stairway in this cliff somewhere that we don't know about that they do. So they follow the guy. You can see where the story is going. The army makes their way up, and they destroy Sardis. They conquer Sardis. Because Sardis was not watching they thought that they were impenetrable on every side, that no one could get in. And you know what the crazy thing is about that? History repeated itself. Again, fact check me on the date, but I think it was 250 BC, Sardis was once again conquered for the same reason. They weren't watching. They thought, oh man, no one's going to figure this out. We got this secret. Jesus tells the Sardis church that they should be watching or else he is going to come upon them at a time they don't know because they're not watching. Now, this admonition to be watchful, I think, is lost in a lot of the church today. We don't talk much about the return of Jesus anymore in a lot of our churches. Thankfully, this isn't one of them. I know we talk about the return of the Lord a lot here, but just because we don't know when Jesus will return, mark this down, doesn't mean we should be surprised by it. I'll say that one more time. Just because we don't know when Jesus will return doesn't mean we should be surprised by it. We should be watching for his return every day. Personally, looking back on my early days as a Christian, the thing that really was uh, a fire in my heart that got me so excited on a continual basis was just learning about the return of Jesus, the soon coming, the rapture of the church, those doctrines. I truly believe that an expectant return of Jesus is one of the characteristics of a healthy church and a lively Christian walk. If we're not watching, we might be surprised, might not be ready. I don't know about you guys, but I want to be found ready and watching ready for Jesus. All right, guys, we are coming short here on time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to our last C. You guys, if, I'm just, I'm not even going to have you repeat everything. I just want to see if you've got the C's because I'll be so happy with that. First thing we looked at was there was a condition of the church, and we know what that was. And we saw that there was a cause of that condition. But thankfully, there was a cure for that condition. And we saw just now that Jesus has a caution for us to be watching. Now we want to look at his commitment to the believers there in Sardis. The overarching assessment of this church by Jesus is that they're dead. But who they are as a whole is not a reflection of every individual. Look there again at verses 4 and 5. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name 
before my Father and before his angels. Jesus acknowledges the remnant of believers who have not defiled their garments. In this, I see Jesus modeling what we read in Jude. Go back two pages or so to the left. Jude, verses 21 or 23 there. In Jude 21, we see, we see uh, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some, have compassion, making a distinction. But others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, on the remnant, I see Jesus making a distinction and having compassion. But on others, the dead part of Sardis, he warns them, despising even the garments defiled by the flesh. As we've just seen, the call for those who have defiled their garments is to watch, it's to repent, it's to hold fast, it's to go back to the first works. But for the faithful remnant, he has three very specific commitments that we'll look at in closing here. Number one, they will walk with him in white garments. Now, white garments here are used in contrast to the defiled garments. These white garments speak of a clean, pure, right standing before God. There's two things I see here regarding these white garments. Um, one of the last references I'll have you turn to. Go over to Matthew 22. See what Jesus said about these white garments. And we won't read the entire parable of the wedding feast, but in Matthew 22, verse 8, pick it up in the middle of the parable here. It says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away. Cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. This white garment we see in Revelation several times. You can go back there if you haven't already. Uh, in the same chapter, Revelation chapter 3, verse 18, he counsels the Laodiceans to buy from him gold refined in the fire, that they would uh, truly be rich, and white garments, that they would be clothed. Turn the page, chapter 4. We see in verse 4 of chapter 4, the four and twenty elders around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones... I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. Over in chapter 6, verse 11, the tribulation saints says, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said that to them that they should rest a little while longer. Now, the first thing we see here about this promise, this commitment to clothe them in white, is that it is required to enter heaven. You've got to have this. The second thing we see about it is that this white garment is received. They didn't have to go buy an extra, you know, bucket of Tide or some detergent to bleach their, their clothes so they can make it to heaven. The white garment is something Jesus gives. They shall be clothed in white for they are worthy. They're right standing before God. A second commitment that Jesus makes to these faithful believers is that they will not have their names blotted out of the book of life. Now, this one really freaks people out, I think. And what does that mean? Is it possible to have my name blotted out of the book of life? We are not opening that can of worms this morning. But I will say this. The book of life is a book that contains the names of all saved Christians. And as we pointed out earlier in our study, if the interpretation is not given in the immediate context, where is it? Elsewhere in the Bible. I believe Jesus is drawing on a word picture found in Exodus chapter 32, and this will be our last reference this morning. If you'll turn with me 
to Exodus chapter 32 because I do think it's important enough that we catch what's being put down here. In Exodus 32, I'll give you the backstory. Moses has been on the mountain. He's received the tablets. <laughs> Meanwhile, things aren't going so well down below. The children of Israel have said, well, man, this guy Moses has been gone for a while. What are we going to do? Aaron says, well, everybody give me your gold. They'll throw it into the fire. They end up fashioning a golden calf, dancing around the thing naked, can't leave him alone for two seconds. Moses comes down. The Lord's like, hey, you need to go check out what's going on. This isn't good. He sees what's going on. Oh, my gosh. You guys have totally blown it. What are you doing? Moses comes back. He pleads with the Lord. Check out this heart of Moses. Look in verse 31 of Exodus 32. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now, these believers in Sardis, I believe, are being told by the Lord that like Moses, they would not bear the judgment of the dead part of the church in verse 2. Jesus is saying, I will not blot your name out. Even though you're part of that church, even though things aren't going well at your church, even though it seems like it's dead, there's a few of you there who have held fast, you've been faithful, and I will not blot your name out of my book. I think that what we need to do in this passage is focus less on what's possible in that regard, and on the amazing, strong promise Jesus is making the remnant. I will not blot your name out of my book. Now, Jesus is the only one who could blot their name out of the book. For him to say, I will not do this, is the strongest affirmation of their security, I think, that you could find. We said that there were three commitments, though. First, that they would be clothed in white. Second, that they would not have their names blotted out of his book. And lastly, we see that Jesus will confess their name before his father and before his angels. I kind of think that when the roll is called up yonder, Jesus has to say present for you. That's just something I believe. The Bible doesn't say that, but nor does it say there's a rule that's called. But <laughs> if there is, Jesus promises those who are faithful to him that he will confess their name with boldness. He will not be ashamed of you. That he will go to the Father for you and he will say, Brian, come on in. This is Brian Owens, Father. I hope he says that about me. Um, if I hold fast. Now, the good news is, if you confess him before men, Jesus says what? He will confess you before his Father. And in closing, the last verse says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He closes every one of those letters that way. Well, this morning, the Spirit may be saying something different to each of us. Maybe... You needed encouragement that the Lord's not going to forsake you. That your name will not be blotted out of the book. That you've been faithful. He'll confess you before the Father and you'll be clothed in white. Maybe you needed the encouragement to watch for the Lord. Maybe stop looking for the return of Jesus. Maybe we need to remember how we receive. Just to go back. And those first days, spending time in simple dependence on the Holy Spirit, asking Him to lead us, give us wisdom and understanding and might, and all of these things we are so empty of without Him. Maybe, for some of us, we need to be reminded about what causes that. Um, and that we could be deceived by our own reputation. That we could have a name that says 
right? That's a really alive person. But in actuality, things maybe aren't going so good spiritually. I started off this morning saying that every now and then we need to ask a question. How are you really doing spiritually? I don't know. It's not for me to know. But Jesus does have his finger on the pulse of every one of us this morning and collectively as a church. How is Calvary Chapel Williamsburg doing this morning? I think we all have thoughts, right? I hope we're doing really well. The only one who truly knows is the Lord. We are the sum of our individual parts, I think. And I think the best thing for us to do is to ask the Lord, where am I at? How am I truly doing this morning? So what we're going to do is we're going to close service. Kiri can come on up. And I'll do one song to close service.